Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Pastor Snowden, for giving me the honor of addressing your congregation this morning. First of all, I got here for Sunday school. And prior to Sunday school, we had an address by Mr. Mendel. And all through Sunday school, I'm like, okay, my wife must have stolen my notes and <laughs> sent them here beforehand. You know I've been talking about the same stuff I'm going to talk to you about this morning. And this, that's, a, that's just a little bit scary. Uh, so you'll see some similarities of what we've already talked about this morning for those of you who are in Sunday school. Okay. Very first thing, very first thing that I want to talk about is the American dream. How many here have, have known about or heard about the American dream? Go on, raise your hand. One PM. Group participation here. Okay. Gotta get my little clicker here. All right. The American dream started with the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution, as a lot of Americans believe in. Start with the Declaration of Independence. And it is where we learn about some ideals called life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today, the pursuit of happiness also includes things like upward mobility, home ownership, education, the opportunity for our children to be educated with, with decent higher education and have good jobs and careers, and retirement. Everybody agree with that? Life and liberty were secured by the de Declaration of Independence and all those people, men and women, who have fought defending our Constitution. So today, what we're going to talk about is the pursuit of happiness. Growing up, somewhere between the time I learned how to tie my shoes and the time that I learned my multiplication table, I missed the class on how to be happy. I, I instead, I took a course on how to be miserable and how to make everybody amount, around me miserable while I tried to become happy. In our houses, in our homes, in our schools, in our churches, we teach all kinds of life skills. Things like brushing your teeth, how to get dressed. But we fail to teach how to be happy. So how is it that we achieve happiness? And what is it that makes us happy? What I'm going to tell you, this is what I believe, is that we are only happy when we fulfill the purpose that God placed on this, placed us on this earth for. That is when we become happy. The next very question that I would expect you to ask me is, so what is our purpose? And for that, we're going to jump into our very first scripture. From the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 5 through 7. Now, the only actual part of this scripture that applies to the message I'm going to, uh, that I'm giving you, is verse 7. But I wanted to give you verses 5 and 6, so you can see the context that this is in. What's happening here is God is calling, is gathering his people, all, all the sons and daughters of Israel, everybody who is called by, by his name. So, in verse 5, it says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Then we go into verse 7 where it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. As we see here, everyone who is called by my name. Everyone here, I assume, is a Christian, right? You see, are you Christian? Hey, you're a Christian because you're called by the name of Jesus Christ. He is our God. He is our Savior. So, if you are a Christian, you are called by his name. It also, at the end of verse 7, says, Whom I formed and made, meaning that Jesus Christ formed and made you. He spoke you into existence. He is the word of God. Okay. And it also, in the middle of that, says, Whom I created for my glory. 
So, what is our purpose on earth? To bring glory to God. Everybody agree with that? We were actually talking about that this morning, weren't we? That's kind of, kind of a little bit eerie. That you would already know what I'm going to talk about before I get here. So anyway, what is glory? And how do we fulfill our purpose of bringing glory to God? Well, the word glory comes from a Latin word, glori glorious. And it means fame or renown. In the Bible, it is used to denote the manifestation of God's presence in our life. Now, in 2007, Teresa, that is my wife, and I, we appeared to have the manifestation of God's presence all over our life. We attended church regularly. We had a successful business. We led charmed lives. Everything we did just seemed to come out perfect. Even immigration paperwork. Teresa immigrated from the Philippines. She is now a, a U.S. citizen. But even the even her immigration paperwork, which so many people have trouble with, all we did is fill out the papers ourselves, mail them to the to the immigration service with the check for the fee, and lo and behold, she gets her her documents back, and she is now a resident alien of the United States for two years. Even that went perfect. Okay. Nobody else that we knew had that happen to them. Then the economy crashed, and that is when things changed. We found that Teresa and I had become addicted to prosperity. We were indentured slaves to the American dream that we required a certain amount of income every single month to maintenance our debt. And when that income went away, it was just like the withdrawal from narcotics. I tell you the truth, that when we were high on prosperity, we were as happy as can be. There was absolutely nothing that could touch us. But when that prosperity left our household, we crashed and burned and hit lows that we had never seen before. We were addicted to the American dream, and it ended for us. Now, the next statement, I'm going to give glory to God for that, because we lost virtually everything we owned. Okay. What we had fit in the back of our 1995 Suburban. That's what we were left with. Okay. For somebody who is in their early 40s, that is unpleasant, to say the least. No home, no business, no job. We have a 1995 Suburban, and the only reason we had that is because when we, were, when we had money, I loaned somebody else money. And when we lost everything, they gave us that Suburban as repayment for the loan. Okay. <laughs> the only reason we had the car in, in the first place. And we packed everything up and came to Oklahoma. Okay, we lost everything. And it was only after we lost everything that we were free to do anything. <clears throat> it is much easier to rebuild when the record was cleared away from for us. It broke the bondage that we had and the addiction to the American dream. And in return, we found happiness. Now you might say, how does losing virtually everything you own bring happiness? And for that, we're going to look to the second scripture that we're going to look at today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Here we're going to talk a little bit about the churches in Macedonia. Macedonia, by the way, is, a, is an area of Greece. Give you a to get there. It says, chapter in, in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, 
their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then to us, keeping with God's will. This scripture is, is actually really important. Because first of all, in poverty, they had joy. Extreme poverty. They were one of the most persecuted churches of the early first century church. They, these people were the equivalent of dirt poor. Nobody in America has seen poverty like this in, in probably a good 80, 85 years. They gave beyond their ability. So not only did they give what they had, they gave beyond what they had. Now, if you remember a parable that Jesus told, sitting outside the temple, a rich man came and he put money into the offering in the, at the temple, and then a widow came and she had only two coins, but she gave both of her coins. And, in, and Jesus told us, this is the widow's mite story, if, you, if you're familiar with it. Jesus tells us that the small donation that that widow gave was held greater to her account than all the money that the wealthy man gave simply because she gave out of her need, not out of her abundance. It is unfortunate, but Americans often give out of their abundance and never consider their need, the, you know, giving out of their need. And before, before you tar and feather me and drag me outside <laughs> and hear anything, we're going to get into a little bit farther about that. Because the important part of this is not what we give. The important part of this is the heart behind the giving. That widow gave what she had out of her need because she felt a need to give to God. Okay. It says they gave themselves first to the Lord. That is a commitment to God. For us it would be a commitment to Jesus Christ. That is the recipe for happiness. The commitment to God, coupled with the giving beyond their ability, leads to the joy. You don't have to be in poverty. The issue about the poverty is there to show you that you can have joy even when you're in poverty. When you have nothing, joy does not go away if the joy comes from God. Okay. My notes here tell me that if we give of ourselves first to the Lord, we will be in God's will, and from there all the troubles of the world will be meaningless. Now, you remember the song, Seek Ye First, right? I think probably everybody knows that song. It's real popular. <coughs> it comes from a scripture, Matthew 6, 33. I'm not going to sing it because I don't want you to get up and leave. <laughs> it, but it, the general idea is if you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. When Teresa and I put that song into practice, and I use the song because that's where the idea came to us from listening to that song. When Teresa and I put that song into practice, even though we were left with nothing, we sought to do good of to others. We gave generously of what little we had, and the result was absolutely amazing. Because we did not intend to get anything out of it. Look at the Gospel of Luke real quick. I'm not going to read it to you other than it's up there on the board. Okay. Luke says, that we will be given as we give, with the exception that it will be pressed down and shaken together and running over. Now, for those of you who bake, I'm an amateur baker. I like to make cupcakes now and again. You'll see some of them on Thanksgiving. We're going to bring cupcakes. Anyway, take a cup of flour. If you take a cup of sifted flour and then pack it down and shake it and fill it back up again, it is considerably heavier than the sifted flour. And that's what God is saying here, that by the same measure, that cup that we use to give, it will be given back to us, except God is going to press it down and shake it together. So the reward of giving is much greater than the initial gift. Now, I'm not going to tell you if you 
if you put ten dollars in the offering plate, you're going to get twelve back. Okay, because that is not how God's economy works. What I am going to tell you, if God tells you to put ten dollars in the offering plate and you do, you will receive a blessing that will be worth much more than ten dollars to you. Okay, that is God's economy. Okay, now there is absolutely nothing wrong with wealth. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saving money. I only could wish that I had saved more. There's nothing wrong with wanting more for our children than we've had in education, in careers. There's absolutely nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. Everybody likes nice things. Unless we become addicted to them or consumed by them. So where we spend every waking moment of our lives attempting to hold on to what we have and gain more. That is where we run into problems. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, it says, Keep yourself free of the love of money. And in 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, The root of all evil is the love of money. Notice, it does not say that the money is the root of all evil. It said, or to keep yourself away from the money. What it says is to keep yourself away from the love of money. That love of money will separate you from God because you cannot serve two masters at the same time. Because you will either hate one and love one and despise the other or you will serve one and fail to serve the other. So, being wealthy is not a sin. Relying on that wealth instead of God's provision is a sin. And even more important, teaching our children to rely on their own ability instead of on God is also a sin. Uh, Mr. Mendel was talking about teaching our children to pray. It never even dawned on me that the fact that Teresa and I pray in front of our children is actually teaching them to pray. It wasn't a conscious thought. It just seemed like the right thing to do. So we do it. At two years old, Yuri started blessing our meal before we eat. True, it is a standard rote prayer. You know, uh, thank us for this food type of prayer. However, it makes him comfortable praying in public. We went to California, the children and I. Oh, what a trip. 32 hours with two, two, with two toddler children and a single cab pickup truck. There and back. While we were there, we went out to eat at a restaurant. Yuri mentioned that we had not prayed for our meal. So we all stopped, and he blessed our meal. It brought the restaurant to a standstill. There were people all over the restaurant. They were standing up to look at, who is that praying? And it was because it's a little kid, and he is praying an elaborate prayer for our meal. It's a rope prayer that he knows. But it got the waiters and the waitresses to stop moving. It, the people stopped talking. An entire restaurant in, in the state of California came to a standstill because a child prayed. Okay. Not rehearsed, not planned. It just happened. So we need to teach our children to rely on God, not on their own ability. Now, it is my, also my belief, we have a doctor in our presence, Dr. Bob, that doctors are gifts from God to us. I rely on my doctor and my dentist to know what they're doing and to do it well. They, so God can use our intellect for his purpose. It is only when our intellect usurps the authority of God that we run into problems. Our brains and our ability to reason is a gift from God. Now, I actually, that was a little sideline there. Sorry about that. <coughs> okay. That is the flag of Macedonia. I do not know if that flag flew over Macedonia when the Bible was written. The only purpose that that flag shows on that screen right now is to make an otherwise black and white slide have a little bit of color. <laughs> okay. Now, the Macedonians gave themselves first to the Lord. And in the book of Galatians, actually, no, let's back up a little bit. Luke. Everybody knows who Luke is. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. 
he also wrote the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, he states that he considers his life worth nothing if only he may finish the task that God gave him. The task was preaching the gospel. That is a prime example of commitment to Jesus Christ over our own lives. If you're interested, that's found in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 24. The one I want to look at, though, is in Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. I'm not going to read that either, but that's okay. Paul states, now you have read I'm going to read it. Sometimes I just need to. That's uh, Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. And this is not Galatians, that's Galatians. <coughs> They hear Paul is talking, and he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So what Paul is saying is, is that the life that he was given to him at birth is over. When he accepted Jesus as his Savior, his life ended, and his life now belongs to Jesus. <clears throat> and he did not care whether he lived or died as long it was, as it was the will of Jesus. That is a hard pill to swallow for a lot of Americans. But I can tell you today that my life ended when I made that commitment to Jesus. That was not the day I was saved. I was saved almost 20 years ago. 18, 19, something like that. This happened recently. When I woke up one morning and all the trappings of the American dream had been stripped from me and everything that I held dear with the exception of my wife, this was before the children, was, was gone. And it was with that time that I made a commitment that Okay, this is just wrong. So I surrendered to Christ and said, Okay, Lord, it's, it's up to you. You make me what you want me to be, and that's what I'm going to be. My life was over, and it became dedicated to God and only God. My stated purpose, to bring glory to Jesus Christ. I think I'm on another page here. My state of glory is to bring purpose to Jesus Christ. My happiness depends on doing what he told me, which is service and generosity towards other people. The life I was born with is of no value. My wife holds the same commitment as I do. We actually sat down and discussed it before I made this presentation because I didn't want to speak for her. <laughs> But, but I, I just figured that she had also made the commitment because she didn't fight me on anything that we were doing. Okay. But our lives are of no value except in completing the task that God gave us. What is the task? So you know what our purpose is. Our purpose is to bring glory to God. That's for all of us. Every single one of us that calls himself a Christian, their purpose is to bring glory to Jesus Christ. What is the task that God has given us? That task is to go make disciples of all the nations. Again, if you are Christian, that is the same task that God has given every single one of us, to go make disciples of all the nations. <clears throat> Let's jump back here to the pursuit of happiness a little bit. Under the pursuit of happiness, if you remember, I included upward mobility. I'll tell you the truth when I no longer cared about my own personal life and I dedicated my life to Jesus Christ, upward, upward mobility became a non-issue. Upward mobility is the increase in either wealth, social standing, or academic standing. All three of those things became non-issues to me. Upward mobility has now been redefined as heaven-bound. That is my upward mobility. I plan on going to heaven. <clears throat> Home ownership. That was the next one on the list. When we came to Oklahoma, like I said, we came in, in the back of a 1995 Chevy Suburban. Okay? 
In Oklahoma, even during the height of the crash of the economy, there were still jobs here if you were willing to work. They weren't the best jobs in the world. They didn't pay the best in the world. But if there, but there were jobs here. Unlike we would, we came from El Paso, Texas, where if you didn't speak Spanish, you didn't work. Okay, that was just the way it was. We came here, Teresa and I, and we both went to work. We bought property in Oklahoma and paid cash for it, and we built a home debt free. Mind you, it's a little house. Okay, it is a house that serves our purpose. It is a house that allows us to, well, okay, let me rephrase that. It is a house that forces us to spend time with our children. Okay, and our children, more importantly, to spend time with us. So that they get to learn not how to be two and three, they get to learn how to be older. So where they're constantly increasing in knowledge instead of children teaching children. <coughs> okay, I'm there. Now, my children, when they grow up, remember the next one on the list is education. Okay. I want my children to know God first. I want them to grow up in a household that is completely sold out and dedicated to service to Jesus Christ, where there is no other priority in our life, where everything we do or say has a focus of how is this going to affect the mission that Jesus Christ gave us. That's where I want my children to, to grow up. That alone, that education will be priceless to them. However, they will learn things like reading and arithmetic because they are necessary skills. They may go to college or trade school, and we'll see what kind of career that they have. As far as retirement, I have no intention of retirement. I plan on dying in service to Jesus Christ. That is my retirement plan, that God will call me home in his service. Now, we were enslaved to the American dream. Jay has actually heard this a couple of times. <laughs> There's nothing new to him. We were, we were, God does not desire us to be a slave to anything. Not to money, not to prestige, not obviously not to alcohol or narcotics. Being a slave is not in God's will. And if it's not in God's will, it is a sin. Teresa and I redefined our American dream. It was drastic. It was an upheaval. It was painful. But I can tell you that it can be done in much smaller steps over a greater period of time so that it is not painful. And the redefinition does not necessarily include being poor. What it includes is a change of our heart not our physical circumstances. Our hearts, or anyway, my heart, because I can speak from personal experience, my hearts have become callous. And it was not until that callous had been stripped away, violently ripped away, what they call circumcision of the heart, that I began to understand. When I serve my purpose, it brings glory to God. <laughs> Boy, I am going to run over. I am so sorry. Every single Christian has the same purpose, to bring glory to Jesus Christ. I know people who have extreme wealth. Going to go see them in Oklahoma City next week, as a matter of fact. But they bring the glory to God every single day because their heart is in the right place. I also know people who are extremely poor, very, have very little money. Again, they bring glory to God every day because of the condition of their heart. And the condition of our heart changes and is brought into a right place with one thing, prayer. Continual, unending prayer. You have to want it. But if you pray for it, God will do it. Now, one other thing that we need to talk about too bad. One of the things that we need to talk about is diversity amongst believers. If everybody that calls themselves a Christian is poor, 
we will miss an entire segment of humanity with the gospel message. If, we're, if every single Christian is uneducated, we're going to miss whole segments of the population with the message of Christ. We need to have diversity amongst the ministers of Jesus Christ. We need to have social diversity, economic diversity, and academic diversity. Therefore, it obviously cannot be the will of God that everybody become poor. The only people who actually need to become poor are the ones who love money. Because, like me, the things like social standing, economic standing, and academic, academic standing were important to me. And I built a divide between those things and God that I could not cross. When God tore down that divide and took away all the stuff that built that divide, it was only then that our service to God became effective. So if you don't have that divide by, by the trappings of the American dream, then there's no reason to get rid of it. Serve God and be joyful. Now, <coughs> I think the last thing I'm going to talk about is <coughs> a question. When I was in California, my family is real big on education. We are all college educated. Most of us have higher, uh, higher than master's degrees. Not me. I'm the, I'm the black sheep. Hey, my sister asked me, what if you're wrong and there is no God? You will have wasted your entire life serving a God that doesn't exist. And you know, this is actually part of a much longer conversation, but I'm going to give you my response about what if you're wrong. And I said, let's assume for a moment that I am wrong and there is no God. I cannot see how a life spent improving the quality of other people's lives could possibly be counted as wasted. Especially if the very act of improving the quality of somebody else's life makes me happy. And this is what it means to be committed to service to Christ. When serving other people and placing their needs in front of yours makes you happy, you are a servant of Christ. As long as you're doing it in his name and giving God the glory. So, I discovered my purpose. I found true happiness along the way. In, an, in exchange, I also found that I loved my wife and children more. I found that I loved my neighbor more. I, uh, and I found that all the stuff of this world became unimportant and much easier to give away when it brought glory to God. Now, <clears throat> I am going to college right now, which is the reason for the video camera. So I can watch this and I can see how I present and make it better next time. And as part of that college, they say that every good sermon includes an altar call. However, I think everybody in this room is Christian. Am I right? So, and because we're running short on time, I am actually going to skip the altar call, which is... Thanks, Richard. I will leave the prayer up there. If you do not know Christ is your Savior, take the time before you leave here today to ask Him to become your Savior. And with that, that is the conclusion of my message. Thank you very much.